So uh, I'll start out with this beautiful quote from Rumi. You might recognize the first part of the title of this talk from this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes to reflect on with its many, many layered meanings. But it turns out that this idea of having an ocean, an entire ocean and a drop of water also has some scientific meaning. And that's what I'm going to be exploring in our time together today. So before we quite get to environmental DNA as a method and what we can do with it, I just wanted to sort of reintroduce myself for those that I haven't met before and let you know a little bit more about what I do as a researcher, the themes that drive me. So as an evolutionary biologist, I'm fascinated by biodiversity and the spectacular array of shapes and functions and behaviors that we see around us on our planet, both on land and in the sea. And as a scientist who studies biodiversity in a, what we can say is often impaired and human impact the ecosystems, I'm also concerned with how we can preserve diversity and how we can inspire the next generation to care for the ecosystems that sustain us. So I won't bore you with my entire life story, but I do want to just give you a bit of context about how I got here and some of my research leading up to this point. So I finished my PhD, as Michelle mentioned, at Stanford and particularly at Hopkins Marine Station. I know many of you are familiar with Hopkins Marine Station and PG, where I worked on population genetics of gray whales. And then I moved to New York for family commitments, where I did my postdoc work at the American Museum of Natural History. And so that's how I ended up being a research associate at that institution. And there I began working on the evolutionary genetics of fishes. And those fishes included everything from African cichlids to electric catfishes and many things in between. And then from there, I started a faculty position at City University of New York, where I continued building a research program focused on the molecular ecology of freshwater and marine species. And then in 2020, finally made the leap to return to Monterey Bay and join the faculty at CSUMB. So at all these points, I've been really fortunate to work with amazing colleagues and students and to be able to study organisms in some of the world's most interesting and diverse places. My research focuses on three major themes, and don't worry, I'm not going to talk about all of them today. So I'm just going to focus on this, this last one here. But I did want to briefly mention the first two in case it's of interest to anyone. So first, my lab uses genomic tools to understand how speciation occurs in fishes. And in particular, we have a major new project examining how rock fishes evolve. And so if anyone has any special interest in rock fishes, I'd love to chat with you more. Um, and then second, we use DNA from both modern and ancient samples to trace how megafauna are affected by, so megafauna like whales and turtles are affected by human activities like hunting and climate change. And then finally, this last one is what I'm focused on today. We use DNA from the environment, environmental DNA or eDNA, to track and survey biodiversity in human impacted ecosystems. Okay, so why are we concerned with using eDNA to study these ecosystems? Well, as humans, we of course depend on aquatic ecosystems. We depend on oceans, rivers, lakes, and estuaries to provide ecosystem services that sustain us. And these ecosystems contain an amazing diversity of life, but they're some of the world's most threatened places, right? Due to pollution, overfishing, dams, other forms of habitat degradation that we're all sadly familiar with. In the case of both marine and freshwater fishes, they face all these kinds of problems. Freshwater fishes are particularly imperiled with almost a third of species facing extinction. It's a pretty remarkable statistic. So if we want to conserve these species and protect these habitats, it's crucial that we understand where those species live and how they use those resources. So effective conservation essentially depends on knowing where species live and understanding how the landscapes where they're living are changing over time. So the question then becomes, how do we actually figure out where species live? So part of the challenge in getting information about where species live is that historically this has meant some pretty invasive methods. So for example, traditional survey methods for fishes include electrofishing, trawl surveys, and seining, all of which 
can kill or at least really, really stress out those animals. However, in the last couple of decades, there's been a revolution in many new technologies, including passive detection methods that can be used to detect species. And among these, we now can count molecular tools, which we can use to monitor and to try to predict where species are located. And using these methods, we don't even need to lay a finger on the animals themselves. So it requires much less in the way of harm to these populations that we are trying to study and to conserve. All right, so then how does this work? So the answer is a relatively simple concept, but there's complexities in the implementation that I'll describe. This method might sound a little bit at first like witchcraft, but it's not. So the method's called environmental DNA analysis, and it is dependent on the fact that all of us, all the time, are shedding DNA into the environment. So this might be a familiar concept through shows like CSI, right? When you open a door, a tiny bit of your DNA is left on the doorknob. When you drink out of a coffee cup, a tiny bit of your DNA is left on that coffee cup. Well, that's not just true for humans, it's true for all creatures, right? So for creatures that live in the water in particular, they're shedding DNA into the water column constantly, all the water around them. And this means we can collect that DNA, which we call eDNA, environmental DNA, to distinguish it from the kind of DNA that we would take directly from the organism itself. And we can sequence that DNA to learn about the species that live in a particular ecosystem. So, you know, I'll talk a little bit more in a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of this method, but one of the nice things is that it is relatively fast, especially when you compare it with traditional surveys, and it often allows you to survey with more frequency and in places that would be difficult to do traditional surveys. And then, you know, as I mentioned in the last slide, best of all, there's really minimal impact on the ecosystems themselves because all you need to do is collect some water. So this eDNA comes in the form of sloughed cells, species, and gametes, all of which contain DNA. So, you know, besides CSI, you might be familiar with this basic idea now that we unfortunately have, have learned about how we can track viruses. But if you've heard of sampling wastewater or sewage to detect the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the techniques that we're using here are really similar. And so in both cases, we're taking samples here, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, it's water or sewage, and we're testing it for DNA fragments that are unique to a particular organism. So in the case of this SARS-CoV-2 wastewater testing, we would want to be looking for molecular markers that are unique to the coronavirus. So in our case, we're looking for molecular markers that are unique to fishes and maybe other vertebrates. You can really use them for any group of organisms, which is part of their advantage and flexibility. So these methods have really gained a lot of traction and public support during the pandemic. And I think we can expect that in the future, we're going to see a lot more of this kind of wastewater testing, not just for COVID-19, but for other pathogens as well. And again, similar technology that we're using here that can be used to look for any other organisms. Okay, so let's think a little bit about why eDNA is particularly useful. So I told you that it's less invasive, so that's great. But why is it that we need this fine scale understanding of where species live? It turns out that we have actually very relatively poor data on aquatic biodiversity at the kind of spatial scales that we would like for conservation. And in particular, with so much of the habitat changing so quickly, including both you know, negative effects like climate change that happened very quickly, El Nino years, et cetera, and then also sometimes positive changes like restoration efforts, right? We, we want to understand how all these processes affect biodiversity at relatively fine spatial scales and across relatively short time frames. But the problem is that many aquatic ecosystems are understudied because they are large, sometimes hard to get to. And we know that they're in flux all the time. And so a single one-off survey may represent very poorly how biodiversity is spread across the landscape. We know that traditional survey methods, in addition to causing the mortality that I mentioned, 
in both the target and non-target species, they're also very time and labor intensive. And so as a result, they tend to be pretty expensive. Some other aspects of these traditional surveys that I mentioned, so here, this is a team that we worked with in the Bronx River in New York doing electrofishing to survey for American eels and other species. You can miss cryptic taxa very easily. So American eels love to hide under rocks. So they'll squeeze themselves under rocks and in these very narrow areas. And electrofishing gets them some of the time, but not nearly all the time. When you do get them, they've gotten a pretty nasty shock. And so there is very sadly some mortality that can occur through that. And then you might have difficulty in accessing particular bodies of water. There might be safety concerns. For example, in this in the Bronx River, as you can imagine, there's all kinds of stuff underneath the surface that we have to worry about as we're netting fish and going along electrofishing. We find all kinds of things on the bottom that are a big safety concern. In addition, many fish taxa and other taxa might be rare or small or cryptic, cryptic in a different way. So they might be very difficult to sample. So if you have, for example, a species that looks very similar to another species, then you need a very experienced person to be able to identify that specimen to species. In addition, fish have many different life stages that can make identification really tough. And we have fewer and fewer taxonomists so that, you know, identifying by morphology alone for, you know, not just for fish, but for other groups in particular can be really, really difficult. So all of these reasons add up to make these traditional surveys using nets, electrofishing, seines, live capture, all of it time consuming and difficult such that we might not be able to undertake surveys at the frequency that we would like to. Okay. So with that, let's dive into the world of eDNA, and I want to walk you through a couple basic concepts before I describe some of the work that we're doing in our lab. So many of you may have heard of traditional DNA barcoding. We can think of it as very, very similar in concept to a barcode on an item in a store. Right? So you've got a sequence of these bands of different sizes, lines of different widths, that when matched to a reference database will tell you what the item is and its price and other aspects about that item. So in a similar way, we can use a DNA sequence from an organism. So here I have two representative sequences where each line here represents a position in the genome at a standardized gene region. So we're looking at the same region of the genome across species and the colors of the lines represent whether that position has an A, a C, a T, or a G in the DNA. And so a particular sequence, when matched with the reference database, will tell us what species we have. So traditional DNA barcoding has been used for many, many decades now and relies on having tissue from an organism. So in this case, you're sequencing one organism at a time. For example, you might sequence a fillet of fish from a fish market to see if indeed that fish is the species that the fish market is telling you it is. So this is a pretty standard method that's used in many areas of forensics. And we can extend it to a newer technique that's really only gained prevalence in the last, let's say, decade called metabarcoding. So in metabarcoding, we are, rather than relying on tissue from one species, we're sequencing DNA from the environment as a whole, but we're still targeting that particular standardized gene region. So we're getting then DNA from whatever organisms have left their, uh, their genetic material in the environmental sample, sequencing it to see what's there. So in this case, rather than just one species, we're getting you know, whatever might be present. Now, it's important to note that this method still relies heavily on having an accurate reference database. And I'll come back to that and I'll mention it in just a moment. Okay, so I think I've given you the beginnings of the idea of what the strengths of an eDNA approach are, but let's just kind of tabulate them here. So we talked about ease of sampling, really all we need is water, right? So there's no special expertise that's necessary and we don't even really need special equipment. You just need sterile bottles essentially. So this really facilitates sampling across 
seasons, across many different types of habitat, and it facilitates citizen science, which is a really wonderful thing as well. Another really cool thing about eDNA is that the samples that you collect can be preserved in perpetuity. So we will take those water samples, and I'll show you how we do that. We'll filter them and extract the DNA from them. And once that total DNA is extracted, we can go back to it years and even decades after the fact to do additional analyses. So let's say that I want to look at the water sample to see what fishes are there. And I do that, and then I freeze my sample. And then 10 years later, somebody else comes along and wants to see what marine invertebrates are present. So, you know, they would be able to use the same sample to analyze the diversity of marine invertebrates in that sample. So you really get this kind of long-term snapshot of diversity. And I think it's a really cool opportunity to start building a library of these snapshots of diversity across different habitats and across time. Another great thing is because we're working with genetic data, we can identify cryptic species, that is that those that we might not be able to tell them apart morphologically. We can find invasive species. You know, it doesn't matter what life stage the organism is at, we will still be able to detect it. We can look for migration and spawning behaviors as well. So being able to sample across different seasons and across different areas really helps with understanding those behaviors. And we can also identify species from many different taxonomic groups simultaneously. So we could take the same sample and we could go all the way from bacteria up to marine mammals. Right? We can use the same sample to look for the DNA of all those species at once. So it makes it a really powerful method to try to reconstruct species assemblages and even to try to understand the relationships between species. For example, if you always found you know, two species in the same place, then you might predict that they had some ecological dependence on one another. So how does eDNA perform compared to other methods of biological survey? This is a study that was done in 2012, and there have been a couple of follow-up studies that have found very similar results, that eDNA really holds its own in terms of the number of species it detects, and it will typically detect as many or more species. Here you see that they did a one-off eDNA study of a particular marine area, and then compared it to surveys that had been done, including night snorkeling, bottom trawling, beach seining, day snorkeling, et cetera, and found that eDNA performed as well as the other best methods for detecting number of species. One method that's kind of growing in popularity now is using other organisms that kind of, if you will, sample diversity across their ecosystems to do the eDNA collection for you. So here, this study from 2012 used leech blood meals to collect DNA from forest mammals in Vietnam. So these researchers, rather than collecting water or soil to find the DNA of these forest mammals, they collected leeches and examined the DNA in the leeches. And they found a terrific diversity. I think it was over 20 different species of mammal, forest mammals that were identified from the blood meals of these leeches. And in the marine environment, similarly, researchers have been using organisms like sponges to see, you know, filter feeders to see what DNA is present in those sponges and using the sponges as essentially natural collectors of environmental DNA. All right, so that's all the positives, but there's no, no free lunches in life. So what are the weaknesses of the eDNA approach? For one thing, unlike working with direct tissue samples, when you are working with an environmental sample and trying to extract the DNA from that sample, as you can imagine, the levels of DNA are quite low. And in addition to being quite low, the DNA that you're getting is often very degraded. So it's quite broken up. And so contamination is something that you have to be worried about constantly. It's an important issue. And everybody that's doing the work needs to be aware of methods to mitigate or try to prevent contamination. So for example, if I am working on an environmental DNA sample in the lab and I sneeze into the tube, well, my DNA from that sneeze is going to way overpower whatever DNA was present in the environmental sample. And when I sequence it, I'm just going to get human DNA back. So that's kind of a silly example, but it happens a lot that we sequence our environmental samples and most of what we get might be human DNA. 
There's also a lot to think about with regard to the lifespan of eDNA in a water column and how it's created, how it is preserved in an environment, and then how it's degraded over time. So there's lots and lots of variables that affect how DNA is shed in the first place by different organisms. As we'll see in a minute, it can differ between species. And then how DNA is preserved in the environment is also different depending on many factors, including the pH of the water, the temperature of the water, things like food availability may affect shedding rates as well, seasonality, turbidity, UV exposure. All of these factors can change how eDNA is both extruded and how it's preserved or degraded. In addition, water movement, of course, will disperse eDNA. And so that's been a big area of study to try to understand if we find a signal of a species in a particular area, particularly if it's in a highly turbulent aquatic system like some marine systems or rivers, then how can we tie that finding, that identification temporally to the species that left that DNA there? In other words, can we make some inferences about how recently that species was present? There also is no single agreed upon pipeline for going from environmental sample to a species identification quite yet. So this has been a big challenge when we think about how to use eDNA in, for example, management contexts or particularly legal contexts. So there's quite a lot of progress in this area and a community of researchers that are working towards trying to come up with a pipeline going all the way from sampling through data analysis so that everybody that is doing this kind of work has sort of a centralized system of methods that we can use. There are a diversity of ways to extract the DNA from environmental samples to process it. And then the data analysis, there are many methods as well. And so for now, there's still not one agreed upon pipeline that we have. The other thing to note is that the sample collection is easy and very cheap. It doesn't require anything special except for just, again, sterile bottles. However, the sample processing, so everything from the filtration up to the sequencing, and then the data analysis itself is more specialized. So it does require a molecular lab and it requires some expertise. And that can be expensive depending on the particular assay. So it's often the case with molecular work that the expense is mainly up front and trying to set up a study. And then once you have a working method, you can expand it so that it's more cost effective. But that initial outlay can be quite expensive. A lot of people would like to use eDNA to infer not just diversity, but abundance. And there's a lot of work toward that goal. But it's still a tricky undertaking for many taxa and systems. So in other words, maybe I go to a marine protected area and I would like to know not just are sea otters present there, but how many sea otters are present. And I'd like to use eDNA to do that. Well, right now that's quite difficult to make that inference, right? We, we don't have a great way to go from number of copies of DNA from sea otters to the number of sea otters. But again, it's a very active area of research and where the protocols have been optimized, it is possible. And I'll show you a few examples of that in a bit. And then finally, accurate identifications of species when we're talking about using metabarcoding to identify species diversity in an ecosystem, they are absolutely 100% dependent on having an accurate reference database. So what do I mean by a reference database? So a reference database is a repository of sequence data in which you have each sequence that's linked to a particular species. So one of the primary databases that we use is the National Center for Biotechnology Information, or NCBI. If you do a Google search for this, you'll find it. It's an incredible resource for all to use, and all genetic data that is published is supposed to end up on this data repository eventually. So it's an incredible resource, but of course also comes with its own little flaws. So ideally, you would like it to be the case that 
folks that have put in a genetic sequence for a particular species have also retained the specimen from which that genetic data came so that you could be able to tie the genetic sequence to an actual specimen, right? So if there's a misidentification or anything like that, someone can go back to that specimen and really do a close look at it to see, well, is this species that they said it is, or is this maybe a related species? But often what happens is th these data are entered into NCBI, some of which might have reference specimens attached and some of which might not. And so there are other databases that do have much more curation when it comes to tying together the sequence data with particular species. They tend to have a bit more of a narrow focus. This is an example of the kind of study that can be used to link abundance with eDNA. So this is a study that my graduate student, Sam Chin, did a few years back. I showed you those pictures of electrofishing in the Bronx River. So along with the team that was doing the electrofishing, Sam collected environmental DNA from sites up and down the Bronx River, specifically looking for how much DNA there was from American eels. And Sam was using a method called quantitative PCR rather than metabarcoding which is quite, quite sensitive to DNA from the particular species that you're looking for. And what you can see here is that when we compare the data from traditional surveys, so those are those left two graphs, and they're showing the length of the Bronx River with biomass and abundance of American eel. So the size of the circle essentially reflects the proportion of biomass or abundance that we find at these different sites along the Bronx River. And we found in this study that our eDNA signal matched abundance really well, but not biomass. And so in a way was comforting. It means that we were able to draw this quite nice relationship between environmental DNA concentration and abundance, but we were a bit confused about the biomass. So it turns out that along the Bronx River, the eels that make it up past the eight or so dams that block the Bronx River, by the time you get up to Westchester, very high up in the river, those eels that have managed to make it all the way up there are gigantic. So there are fewer eels, so the abundance is quite low, but the biomass of the few that are there is enormous. They're huge. <laughs> They're like boa constrictors, really. They're just these enormous, enormous eels, very difficult to catch, but we were able to detect them with eDNA and then yeah, it turned out that our eDNA signal in this case matched the abundance much better than the biomass because of this interesting twist in American eels' ability to get past those huge dams. Another aspect that we have to consider when we think about eDNA and what we're recovering from an environment is that degradation rates vary between environments and even between species. And we're still trying to get a handle on why this is, but it may have to do with species metabolism. It may have to do with the form in which eDNA is actually being shed, whether it's through mucus or feces or gametes, et cetera. But in this case, this was um, a stickleback and a flatfish that were both put into tanks. And these researchers looked at how DNA from these species degraded over time. And they found that the stickleback was giving off much less DNA to begin with but it hit a lower level of detectability much faster than the flatfish did. So this is just one example, but it's been found over and over that species can have these very, very different degradation rates. Okay, so I'll move into just chatting a little bit about how we actually do this work. And at our lab at CSUMB, we collect water generally the old fashioned way using sterile bottles, so sterile one liter Nalgene bottles. We also have a specialized water sampler. I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. So we've got kind of a low-tech way and a high-tech way. But in either case, we want to be very sure that the equipment or the bottles are sterile prior to collection. But a great advantage of eDNA is, as I mentioned, anyone can do the sample collection. And so I have this as part of my molecular ecology course for CSUMB students. We're going out next week again to tide pools to sample water. And I'll show you some of the results that my students found last year, which were pretty cool. This is what the Andy backpack looks like. This is the high-tech system that we use for water sampling. You can see there's sort of a telescoping pole that has a tube on it. And this backpack has a vacuum pump 
So you're sucking up water from the ecosystem and then it's getting filtered in the backpack itself. It's a pretty great system for taking very, very standardized samples. So if you need to keep, for example, the vacuum pressure exactly the same across samples, it's a great method for that. What we come back with is either filters, if we've already filtered the water, or if we have not yet filtered the water, we come back with our liter bottles and then we process samples in the lab. So on the right here, you see examples of what our liter bottles look like. And then we will filter those using a vacuum pump and then extract the DNA from the filter. So here again, we're working carefully with minuscule amounts of DNA. So we have to be real cognizant to avoid any contamination between samples and from the researchers themselves. We talked a little bit about how eDNA can persist in water. This is a common question that we get. So when you take a DNA sample and you find a particular organism, how long ago was that organism there? There's been a lot of studies that have looked at this, and it seems to be on the order of hours to weeks, depending on the ecosystem and the conditions. Stagnant water, you're obviously going to have longer preservation versus flowing water where you have both the dispersal of environmental DNA as well as faster breakdown typically. And then temperature dependent as well. So colder water preserves eDNA better than warmer water. It's a little bit more difficult to get eDNA from tropical ecosystems. And one interesting finding that seems to be quite consistent is that eDNA has a longer lifespan in sediment compared to water. So it lasts a lot longer in the sediment. And we think this is because cells and the DNA molecules themselves probably adhere to sediment particles and are better preserved that way. It may also have to do with oxidative conditions that allow for more or less bacteria that may be consuming the DNA and breaking it down. Okay, and with the time we have left, I'll just mention a few of the projects that we have going on in our lab, just to give you a sense of what we can do with these methods. So this first project is funded by New York Sea Grant and the Lounsbury Foundation, and it's focused on mapping marine biodiversity, particularly species of concern. So that includes marine mammals, turtles, sharks, and some fishes for the purpose of informing New York's ocean action plan. And in particular, planning for wind energy development and trying to make sure that wind energy projects are placed in ways that don't disrupt critical habitat for these species of concern. This project is focused on the East Coast and the New York Bight in particular, but you know this is obviously also a huge upcoming issue for the California coast. And our hope is that we'll be able to use this technology in a similar way to inform energy planning on the California coast. So this is a study that we published last year. This was our first paper to come out on this effort. And this was a test of the eDNA methods for detecting cetaceans in New York offshore waters. So this came out last year in the journal Frontiers in Conservation Science. And here what we did was we collected water samples in concert with marine mammal surveys, and we were able to detect the presence of four different cetacean species using these water samples collected over seven different boat trips. And we confirmed the presence of the species in the majority of cases with visual sightings. We also have some acoustic data that we're now working with to see if we can tie passive acoustic monitoring to environmental DNA as well, to be able to use both techniques at the same time to monitor how these different cetacean species are actually using these environments. We detected primarily humpback whales, and that was the focus of the surveys. But along the way, we also detected fin whales, harbor porpoise, and bottlenose dolphin. We were also able to study how long whale eDNA lasts in the water column. What we did was we took the sample when we sighted the whale or dolphin or porpoise, and then we came back to the same site after 15 minutes and after 30 minutes. And we would have liked to have come back past 30 minutes, but the logistics of these trips made that pretty much impossible. The point of this study was to try to understand if, again, if we detect a whale using environmental DNA, does that mean it was there in the last 10 minutes, the last hour, the last day? So what we learned from this study was that for the most part, environmental DNA drops to a low level in the water after 30 minutes, and actually after even 15 minutes. You can see in this graph here on the upper right, 
that in one case, we found that the DNA in the water actually skyrocketed after 15 minutes and didn't decrease much after 30 minutes. And that was actually a case in which a humpback whale that we sighted, we collected the water, and then immediately afterwards it pooped in the water. <laughs> so it, def it defecated in the water and that poop did not really drift very far away. So it turns out it just stuck around. So if you have a whale pooping in the water, you're going to get a whole lot of environmental DNA, it turns out, and that environmental DNA is going to stick around. That's a whole interesting area of study that we're starting to delve into, how the behavior of animals also can affect how much um, DNA they're shedding into the water column. The other thing that I'll mention as part of this study that I thought was really fun and cool was that you know, while we were doing this project, we realized that we could also use these same samples to learn about ocean food webs. And so from the same water sample that we used to detect the whales, we identified DNA from fish and all kinds of other critters. So here I'm just focusing on the fish and we wanted to see if we could determine if there were particular fish that are often co-located with whales. And perhaps not shockingly, we found that in 100% of our samples where we had a whale, we also found menhaden. So these are sometimes called bunker. And they're known to be among the most important forage fish for mid-Atlantic marine predators. And we find a bunch of other fishes that are likely alongside whales feeding on these schools of bunker, including tuna and mahi-mahi. So we're building this project out over the next several years with this funding from New York Sea Grant to try to conduct broader spatial analyses to detect species of concern. We're going to be doing transects along the New York Bight, gathering data about, again, these species of concern, as well as these ocean food webs. So it's an exciting project, and I hope to be coming back to you in a few years with more information. So that's one of our projects. And then another one of our projects, this is a completely different type of environment, and I think you know, really illustrates how flexible this technique can be. We can also use environmental DNA to find species in places that are traditionally very difficult to survey. So this project is ongoing research with a collaborator at UNAM, Jairo Ariave, and a collaborator at UC Davis, Chris Martinez, to document fishes in cenotes or karstic caves in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. So if any of you have ever visited these cenotes, they can be absolutely gorgeous. Hopefully you went to one that looks sort of like the one on the upper left here. Beautiful and absolutely delightful to snorkel around, super interesting fish that live in there. But there are a whole bunch more cenotes where the entrance looks more like this one on the lower left, <laughs> where the surface access is just the town well or just a, a kind of a hole in the ground. And in those cases, we have generally very, very little idea what species might be living in them. This is important for two reasons. So one is that cenotes have a number of endemic species that have evolved there and only there. And another is that these cenotes are quite threatened by a number of human activities, groundwater pollution, a train system that's been proposed along the coast of the Yucatan. And we have very little idea of how these cenotes are actually connected to each other underground. So we know that in some cases they are, but we often, for the most part, we don't really have a good sense of how. So if you, in other words, pollute one cenote, how might that pollution make its way into a completely different part of the system? So one of the things that we can do is actually use DNA from organisms to better understand that connectivity, both in the past and today. And so these studies are really crucial for understanding how human impacts like water withdrawal or pollution in cenotes of one region of the Yucatan might actually cause system-wide effects. So this is really the first set of studies of its kind. In this one, we looked at fish from across several different areas of cenotes. And here you can see how we sampled across the Yucatan. We looked at the relatedness between fish to determine how these cenotes are connected to each other. And it became clear that we do have connectivity between quite a lot of them. So our most recent eDNA study, again with this same research team, we surveyed cenotes using both visual surveys and environmental DNA distributed across this system. We were also able to retrieve DNA from eight species of bats from the water sample. So that bats are also extremely difficult to sample. 
traditionally, and of course are extremely important too for understanding disease transmission and the evolution of viruses, et cetera. So we're hoping that this method will actually be a really great way to survey cenote biodiversity as a whole, including organisms like bats. Okay, and then finally, I just wanted to mention some of our environmental DNA work around Monterey and Santa Cruz counties, and particularly those that are involving CSUMB students. I mentioned I teach this capstone course, senior capstone course in molecular ecology, and we focus on learning the molecular tools to survey ecosystems. So that includes environmental DNA. These are data from last spring where the students had the freedom to design their own projects as they do this spring. And a few of them chose to focus on environmental DNA in tide pools in Monterey and Pacific Grove. And they asked what species they could find in tide pools of differing size or tidal height. So what's cool is these students did absolutely everything themselves from collecting the samples through the molecular work and the data analysis. It was a really complicated project. And I was super proud of how they were incredibly persistent to learn how to work through you know, failure at different steps and really come out with an extraordinary result in the end. Here's some of the students presenting their capstone research. This is data from one of the groups and what they found was super cool. So they found, first of all, that more than 90% of the DNA in their samples came from species that we know make their habitat in tide pools. So those included tide pool sculpins, woolly sculpins, slender coxcomb, but what was really unexpected to me and kind of jaw-dropping was that they also found DNA from a nice variety of coastal and offshore species, including sea otters, Rizzo's dolphin, gray whales, mola mola. So this tells us that tide pools could be really good aggregators of environmental DNA. And these students, at least two of them, decided to continue the project. They were pretty excited about it including one who already graduated and she's still coming back to the lab once a week to help finish it up. So we're trying to now understand how these signals from offshore might fluctuate during tidal cycles. This particular student that's still coming back did a survey along with some of the current students looking at 12 hour tidal cycles from high to low and back to see how this signal of offshore DNA might change. So stay tuned for that as these students are eager to wrap up their study and publish their results. And then finally, I'll just mention that because eDNA can be so captivating and such a great tool for education, we are really interested in disseminating curriculum in middle and high schools at the appropriate level and in line with next generation science standards. So this project is part of a longstanding collaboration with the Billion Oyster Project in New York City. And I have some great education students who've been working with me they're training to be teachers, and they've been helping to develop curriculum around eDNA. So they're focusing on several curricular themes, including species distributions around oyster reefs and why species live where they live, and understanding how changing environmental conditions might affect species distributions. So essentially, they're trying to help build curriculum around how technology like environmental DNA as well as distributed databases like iNaturalist can be used by citizen scientists to document biodiversity in these different ecosystems. So they did this little pilot project in Elkhorn Slough and got some great results. Okay, so what is next? Well, I mentioned our ongoing projects, whales and tide pools and cenotes. It's just a really exciting time to be working with environmental DNA. And I'm very excited to be continuing this work both here and abroad. And I'm particularly excited to work with local agencies on projects that are driven by timely management questions. So for example, trying to identify habitat for threatened species or identifying the presence of invasive species. And ultimately my hope is that all of these projects will contribute towards a better understanding of how biodiversity is both created and maintained in the many, many rich but threatened aquatic ecosystems that we love and depend on. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge some funding sources, National Science Foundation, New York Sea Grant, Lounsbury Foundation, and the Hudson River Foundation, and many, many collaborators and wonderful students that have worked in my lab in the past and continue to work there now.